I'm turning now to Psalm 133 and verse 1. Psalm 133, a song of degrees or a sense of David. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And our subject is spiritual relations. This is part of a short but ever lengthening uh, series of extraordinary psalms. And uh, here is David, the king, speaking about spiritual fellowship between believers, between the Lord's people. And it's a highly unusual psalm in that respect. And for all, it consists only of three verses. It has great depths and much stimulation for us. So I begin and expound it really under three, possibly four headings. And the first will be the ideal is described. The ideal, the uh, picture of good spiritual relationships between the people of God, of true unity within a church, an individual church of Christ. And it begins with this word, behold. And in the original, it receives, well, it's very expressive. It's emphasized in various ways. So you can read it as see, but with considerable emphasis on the word. Look, look at this, consider this, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The force of this has led many uh, commentators, writers in the past to think that uh, the psalm was written on some special occasion when there was a great and unusual display of unity. Uh, the favorite suggestion, though who knows, is that it was written at the time of David's coronation, after the eight years of civil war, all the hostility, between the major tribes. And now they come together and they affirm David's kingship. And you see the depth of it in uh, 2 Samuel and chapter five. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron and spake saying, behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. That's unusual language. They've just been at war. Also in time past, they said, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that ledest out and broughtest in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord and they anointed David king over Israel when David was 30 years old. So there was a great show of unity among the people and everyone at the time was so happy. Of course, uh, people being fallen uh, beings, it didn't last for very long, but there were other seasons of special demonstrations of unity and outpourings of wonders. So the suggestion is often made that this psalm was uh, penned by David at such a time. And so he points to what is currently going on as if to say, look, see how much happier we are when this is the case, when this is our experience, how much better it is, how much more blessed and powerful we are as a people. He seems, perhaps, to be pointing to something concrete. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. There are various other suggestions. David's own sons were, well, they fought with each other. And it's been imagined that he drew them together uh, for counsel about this issue from time to time. and. Uh, uh, however, there was a tremendous example of unity in a family known to them. 
And so David draws the attention of his sons to that. Behold, how good, how pleasant it is. You see how well these people do under God, and you see how happy they are. So those are the suggestions that uh, uh, there is an example in his mind to which he can point. And it certainly seems possible, but we haven't any idea what it would have been. But obviously there may have been something. However, we look at the substance of the words. Behold, how good and how pleasant. And he isn't just spending words wastefully. By good here, how good it is, he probably means how productive, how beneficial. You can count the benefits when the people of God are in unity together. And how pleasant, not only is it beneficial, but it is delightful. And he is going to deal in the subsequent verses with those two different aspects of it. How good it is, how effective it is, and how pleasant or delightful it is to have unity together as the people of God. And then we can look at other words. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The brethren refers to the same family, brothers and sisters. He's particularly interested in that in this psalm. And so we refer that to brothers and sisters in the Lord. Only Christians really can dwell together in oneness as one. A family of Christians in a church, we're not talking about some kind of ecumenical unity between churches, we're talking here about the individual congregation or church and the ties between the members and the depths of those ties for brethren to dwell together in unity. In the world, you never can have any perfect uh, fellowship and oneness and agreement in the major things of life. People can get on and just put their differences to one side, but the degree of friendship and uh, cooperation and unity that you can achieve between believers is far deeper than even within families. That's our opportunity and the gift that God has given us. How pleasant it is for brethren and his thinking spiritually to dwell together in unity as one. One in Christ, one in the truth, believing, embracing, loving the same things. One in trust, we trust him, the Saviour, the Lord. We trust him in every step of life. One in all the things that are important in the faith which is in Christ. And we can have that unity together. One in aim, fellow believers who we're close to, we have the same aims, that is holiness and heaven and the salvation of souls. These are our great aims. We have the same care, or should have, one for another. Care is a major feature of Christian relations. We have uh, the same concern for warmth and gratitude to God and worship. Oh, dear friends, the blessing that we receive when our heart is in it, when we worship together, is greater than the blessing that we can receive through personal devotions. And that's a theme which one day I intend to pursue in ministry, because many people don't understand it. We have fellowship with God as individuals in our private, our personal devotions, but there are unique promises of God upon the worship of God's people together. And there are benefits that come to us through that which are deeper and more substantial even than those which come to us through private worship. And that we can make out a, a very strong case for. And it's great shame when people don't appreciate all the opportunities we have to worship and to come round the word together because so much blessing streams from this. The Lord 
is training us for eternity when we shall be together in his worship and in learning of him eternally. But then I come, when you see the case generally in verse 1 introduced, I'm coming in a moment to these arguments worked out in detail in the other verses, 2 and 3. But look for, before I proceed, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now, the illustration, obviously, is a family. But these words, dwell together, if we're members of a church, can we say, in any sense, we're dwelling together? To one of the, this, this phrase, dwell together, means we have to talk to each other and as often as opportunity affords. We have to relate to each other. Otherwise, we can't be said in any shape or form to be dwelling together. Of course, we're not a commune. We're not literally living under the same roof. But to uh, honour this phrase dwell means we've got to relate to each other and talk to each other. And beyond just the opening pleasantries of conversation. And we have to work at, uh, at taking an interest in each other and assisting each other very much more than perhaps we do. We have to have regard for each other and pray for each other. We have to be approachable by each other. We have to have a sense of obligation. I have been saved and I have a contribution to make to the prosperity, well-being, and the family ties of the whole group, of the whole family. I have obligations to honour. Can I continue to ask God for this and to pray for that and to request various things while I'm not attempting to fulfil uh, my God-given obligations as a member of a family of believers? So all this has to be thought about when we think of dwelling together in unity, in oneness. Well, I read Galatians 5 because the fruit of the Spirit really applies to this very task of relating together, manifesting love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness, all these things are so vital. Meekness, temperance, that is self-control. All these things apply. So the first verse gives the ideal. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And now in verse 2, we'll consider the pleasantness of it. Verse 2 and 3 seem to reverse the order of the first words of the psalm, behold how good it is, how constructive and how pleasant, how delightful. Well then, these very headings are worked out but in the reverse order. First of all, verse 2, the pleasantness of it. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. Some of the modern versions turn that into the edge of his garments, which is not correct. The skirts of the garments start from the waist. So it really only says that the precious ointment, the sacred ointment that was poured upon the crown, which was on the head of Aaron, the high priest, when he was consecrated, ran down his uh, headgear and his face and his beard and down onto the main garments, the high priestly garments that he wore. He was forbidden to minister until he'd been so anointed. He and his sons who would succeed him or assist him could not minister in the priesthood, in the high priesthood, particularly without this anointing of oil, this consecration to God. And uh, this is used as an illustration for the delightfulness 
of being in true fellowship one with another. And we have to ask why. It is like the precious ointment poured upon the head that ran down and spread across the garments. Well, there are three things about this anointing with oil which uh, serve to illustrate the effect of spiritual unity between brothers and sisters in the Lord. The first thing to notice in the illustration is the uniqueness of the oil. And this is not um, a remote uh, analysis of it. It's quite sensible. It is like the precious ointment. It's not just any ointment. The oil had to be made up according to a particular recipe with particular ingredients. It was not only extremely valuable, but it was designated sacred. It was never to be deviated from. It was a recipe given by God. It is like the precious ointment, both priceless and rare and special and particular. They wouldn't have had such oil for any other purpose. So that's the first thing that we're going to note about it, the uniqueness of it. The second thing, obviously, is the fragrance of it that fills the room. It runs down on the clothes, the high priestly garments of Aaron, and everybody, it is such a powerfully fragrant uh, oil that everybody is very aware of it and enjoys it also. That fragrance is the desirability and enjoyability of it. And then the third thing that you notice in the picture, in the illustration, is that it spreads right the way it's poured on the high priest's crown and down his face and his beard onto the garments. It's poured in such a way that it spreads and those three things illustrate the uh, particular love which is the cement and the substance of spiritual relations between the Lord's people. First of all, this is a unique love and warmth and interest in each other. It is unique. It's given by the Spirit at conversion. Do you remember when you were saved? Do you remember how you loved the brethren? We know that we've passed from death unto life, says the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, because we love the brethren. Do you know how, what it meant to you to be with fellow Christians? How you discovered family? How relating it was? You know how important it was to you? And it, you realize that God had given you a bond, a kinship with fellow Christians. It's unique, this ointment. It's poured from the head. Of course, the head of the church isn't Aaron with his crown, but Christ and his crown. So it comes from Christ. We see the example of it in him, in his ministry on earth, and his sacrificial death for sinners. We see nothing but love coming from him. Everything that he did was did to that, done to that end, that he would save his people and atone for them and bring them to eternal life and fellowship with himself. We receive nothing but love from him. And so this uh, unique warmth and love and family sense is given to us from conversion. Let brotherly love continue, says the writer of the inspired epistle to the Hebrews. You already have it. You were given it at conversion. So the question is, what have we done with it? We've preserved some of it, perhaps, but maybe not much of it, or certainly not all of it. And our task is to preserve it. We were given it. Have we allowed it to be eroded away? Or do we treasure it? and deepen it. I must work at fellowship. I must be a much warmer person. I must consider others much more than I consider myself. I must be more prayerful for others and much more interested in them. I must be a caring and helpful person. 
I must be much more outgoing. I must be much more involved with the fellowship as a whole. So it is a unique oil that is poured out. It transcends race. It transcends class. It transcends age. If I'm old, I don't only relate to older people. If I'm young, to younger people. It transcends seniority in the church. If I've been saved 50 years, I don't only fellowship with people who've been saved between 40 and 60 years. No, it transcends every possible division. It's unique, this desire, this ability, this capacity to have love and kindness toward everyone who is saved. Of course, we have a love of intense sympathy for the unsaved and a desire for them. But we're talking about the unique oil which runs down the head and the beard and the garments of the high priest at his congregation, and he represents the whole body of the Lord's people. Remember, he carries on his chest the names of all the tribes. He is personally the representative of the family. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. And secondly, we think of the uniqueness of it. It is a treasure that we have. This is the most expensive imaginable oil. This is an oil composed by God alone. And we have a treasure given to us that we shouldn't allow to be eroded away. But we should guard it. A capacity to be warm people in the Lord and affectionate people and people who feel for others and people who serve others. It's so precious. It is like the precious ointment. But now we think of the fragrance of it, just briefly, and how pleasant it is. It is so much nicer to meet with people who are genuinely warm towards you. Everybody knows that. That needs hardly to be said. How pleasant it is if the Lord's people are manifesting the capacity for love that God gave them at conversion and are caring and unselfish. And it, it is so pleasurable. There is nothing to be compared with it. You know that the companionship of a cherished husband, wife or dear friend is much more precious, infinitely more precious than a couple of hours in front of the television or just about anything else you can do. It takes hold of your heart and cheers you entirely in disposition and outlook. This is something so fragrant and so pleasant and so enjoyable to have real fellowship one with another. And uh, it's, well, it, it spreads the aroma of Christ and it spreads to other people. If you have been kindly dealt with, you will be moved to deal kindly with others also. It's like that fragrance filling the house of God, filling the room, as Isaac Watts put it. And it is so pleasurable. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that once released and running down the face and the figure of Aaron spread in a sense by its aroma to everyone. And everybody was lifted up. And that's how we should individually like to be. Every one of us should be able to say or desire to say, if I could warm the hearts of others, just by my manner, my, my conversation of Christ, my genuine interest. But we don't want to turn into gushing phonies. Some people do work at that. They, they, it's just all on the surface. I remember a brother some years ago who went overseas and he ran into a circle uh, in the country to which he went where a group of young people his own age were all over him. And he thought, I have never encountered anything like this at home in London. We're all so socially cold. 
he seemed to think to himself. And these people are so warm. Now this is the real thing. And after a while, he found it was all just the culture. It was all just externals. They weren't really that friendly towards him or interested in him. Or uh, uh, it was just a manner. Now we're not necessarily saying that's how we should be. Throw our arms around each other and uh, turn it on for a few minutes. This is something that abides. You know you have a good friend. You know that you have the same things in common, that you're concerned about the same things, and you're, you're genuine, and you're unselfish, and you're caring. It's the real thing that we want, and this is very, very pleasant and uplifting. And of course it's constructive too, because it encourages others. It helps too in the Christian walk when it comes to the need for mutual reproof how much better it is if people have Christian warmth and love and you have the reproof from somebody who you know is your good friend. It makes reproof easier. It's the perfect platform for it. And it gives you grace and you can help each other and correct each other so much more effectively without uh, sacrificing that friendship and that pleasantness. So there is that factor, the fragrance permeates worship too. You worship among people who you are at one with and your heart is assured. And well, I, I must proceed on to this third point, the power and the influence of it, which I've already touched on to some degree. You see that in, in this picture of the precious ointment flowing. But you see it particularly in verse 3. Here's the power and influence illustration. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Now, how does the dew of Hermon and that of Zion illustrate the... Uh, opening point of the psalm, how good, how productive, how powerful it is as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountain of Zion. There's a difficulty in the text. Look at it if you have the verse open. And our King James translators have tried to get round the difficulty by introducing some words in italics that are not in the original text, the Hebrew. As the dew of Hermon that descended upon the mountains of Zion. That's the Hebrew. Yes, but what does that mean? Hermon is a hundred miles from Zion. How can the dew of Hermon descend upon the mountains of Zion? It doesn't make sense. So our translators have suggested something to help us out as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. They have assumed that the original text is speaking of both. It's using both as an illustration of Christian warmth and friendliness and love. Now that's one solution to the problem, to assume that. They've been very clear with us, they've put it in italics, to indicate to us that they've tampered with the text a little and they've uh, uh, put a meaning on it which removes the contradiction. Other people have tried a different way to solve the problem. As the dew of Hermon falls upon the mountains of Zion, how does that happen? Oh, they've said, well, it is, everyone knows this, that the high precipitation on Hermon, the dews are quite astonishing and fantastic and involve a lot of moisture. And after all, it is from that mountain range up in the north, from Hermon, that uh, well, that's the water source uh, for the River Jordan. And the River Jordan flows down the country and eventually gets to its terminal point, which is the Dead Sea. And Jerusalem isn't very far from there. So the idea is that somehow or other, via the Jordan, 
and the flow of its water and so on, uh, Jerusalem is said to benefit. And, and that gets around the problem. After all, the Jew of Hermon does ultimately fall upon the mountains of Zion. But that's not what the text says. It, it literally says, as the Jew of Hermon, that descended upon the mountains of Zion. We are, we are left with a problem in the text. Unless, and this I'm sure is the solution, and it's a very ancient solution to the problem, unless the Jew of Hermon is the literal picture of what happens spiritually with the spiritual Jew that falls from God upon Mount Zion. So the picture is limited to the Jew of Hermon. And that is, I've not seen it for myself, but it is evidently uh, one of the record highs in the world for Jew precipitation and uh, it gives rise to all the growth and the life and the grass and the uh, crops that uh, the river Jordan, yes, that flows from it and a great deal else. And what you can see on Hermon, which you can't see on Zion, the hill beside Jerusalem, and of course the Temple Mount is now called Zion too, and so on. But what you can't see there, you can actually see it in Hermon, and the psalmist seems to be saying, David seems to be saying, that tremendous profusion of dew, which in an otherwise dry place provides for all the vegetation and the life, pictures the blessing that comes upon the mountains of Zion. What is this blessing? Well, it is the love and the friendship that comes from Christ upon his people, that comes from God upon those who love him. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So it's a, a picture of the power of this love and this warmth that descends to us from above, that we should conduct on through the fellowship and to others, the Jew of Hermon gave rise to all the life, not only around that mountain, but in the plains and in the countryside supplied by the Jordan. It was the source of all the life, vigor, color, beauty, everything. Don't you see the Lord seems to be saying, it's through the love whereby you're saved that is put in you as a believer and the warmth and the affection and it is from that that great power and great blessing comes. Well, it's obvious how, isn't it? Take witness. Witness is going to be much more effective from a person who is obviously genuine and interested in you, a person of affection and warmth than someone who's as cold as ice. How can we witness for Christ if we're cold and indifferent and not interested in the witness or its effect? It's not possible. It's that warmth of spirit and that affection and that love of God which comes into us at conversion. If we don't stifle it, if we don't smother it, if we let it deepen and grow, makes us the kind of people who are going to be much easier to listen to, much more convincing and effective in our witness, much more earnest in our prayers. So the Jew of Hermon and its uh, powerful effect in generating life pictures how this warmth and love an unselfishness, an outgoing spirit that God gives us at conversion is in its own way spiritually fruitful. Let me read verse 3 again for you. As the Jew of Hermon, and as the Jew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So what power there is in all this. 
beauty of Christian character is much more evident if our Christian warmth is showing. I've already mentioned that the gospel is commended. It does, by the way, help very much to deflect anger. Witness is a very thorny business. You witness, you're, talk, you're implying people are sinners. Of course you are. You're implying people need a saviour. You're implying people are lost and in a hopeless state and condition. This is offensive talk. You're implying that they're not in touch with God. You're implying they have great needs. You're implying they're going to eternal judgment. These are deeply offensive things to be saying. But that warmth and concern for others that we're given at conversion sees us through. And people can more easily listen to what we're saying and be convicted by it and helped by it. There's power in this warmth. If there was even a flicker of disrespect for the person while we witnessed or disdain, the natural offence of the message would be amplified by that. And people would be deeply offended. There's power in this gift. And then to come to the last heading very briefly, and it's the last half of verse 3, for there the Lord commanded the blessing even life forevermore. This is the very nature of eternal life. It has the character of eternal life. We are going to be living eternally in love and in harmony. It's given to us at conversion. We ought to value it. This, this is my gift for eternity. It is a pledge. It is an earnest, it is a down payment from the Lord of our eternal state and condition. Why do I not treasure it and value it more here in this life to be a person of warmth and affection and genuineness and understanding and sowing ties and cultivating this that the Lord has given me. Now, we are different personalities. Some people are even naturally a little more warm than others. And some people are very uh, uh, much more logical and calculating in the best sense of the word. And uh, uh, some people show their hearts and some people show their head much more. But all of us as believers have this gift if only we realized it and we didn't hide it up this gift of spiritual warmth and we must treasure it and value it and exercise it and pray for it more and more that's the sense of the psalm and that's how i wanted to bring it out behold how good how productive and how pleasant how delightful and enjoyable it is for brethren, members of the spiritual family, to dwell together, to interact. Some people don't even interact much. What a shame. In unity, in oneness, that is, of spirit. And then those two factors, good and pleasant, become momentarily reversed for the reasoning. Verse 2, pleasant is the subject here. It is like the precious ointment. We've looked at that in detail. Upon the head, the crown that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, spreading everywhere so that its perfume was fully released and its attractiveness and its pleasantness. That's Christian love and warmth and mutual care. And then the productiveness comes in verse 3, the dew of Hermon that gives rise to all the vegetation and life and fodder for the animals and so on. 
that equally descends upon the mountains of Zion, but now in a spiritual sense from God. For there, that is in Zion, the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore, and your warmth and your Christian affection and mutual respect and love and helpfulness is the stuff of eternal life and the substance of eternal life. Let's cultivate it, friends. You see the ideal, you see the pleasantness, you see the power and influence of it, and you see the eternal nature of it. That's Psalm 133. And you can read it, and may it speak to your heart increasingly. Every one of us needs it. Let's close.